Well, welcome everybody. My name is Matthew Taylor, and what you were just listening to was the wonderful sound of the Carnaby's Cockatoo, about which we'll be talking a little more later. I'm joining you from the northern beaches of Sydney, where I'm honoured to be on the lands of the Guy Mariagle people, who have been caring for this wonderful country over many millennia. And I'd like to pay my respect to the elders of the community, past, present and emerging. Um, we'd love it if you'd share with us where you're joining us from today. Please use the chat. And uh, if you know who the traditional owners are, then please share that as well. It's lovely to see where everybody's coming from. Now, this is our first webinar of the year, and um, it's one that's full of optimism. So really looking forward to this one. We've got a fantastic bunch of people on, I think well over 100 today, which must reflect some of the optimism that I think everybody's feeling in this new year. Um, certainly over here in Sydney, La Nina is in full swing, um, as it is, I think, across the whole country. So we're getting lots of rain, and that means a lot of the bush heritage reserves are either flooded or at least enjoying some wonderful um, fresh rain and turning at least our arid zone a wonderful shade of green. But today's bush broadcast is taking us to southwest WA. It's an incredibly rich floristic zone, and it has some of Australia's most amazing animals. And we're going to be exploring those and how we restore the bush to protect these native species. We will be recording the seminar, um, so the webinar, I mean. So if uh, you can't keep with us all um, for the next hour, then um, you'll be able to watch it later and the link will be sent through to you. And we'd love it if you have any questions to please post this in the chat. Um, and we will have a session at the end of about 15 minutes where we can respond to those questions. Um, so today I'm joined by two very passionate people. Um, they're going to share their work in what uh, we do in the Southwest. Um, first up is Angela Saunders. Um, she's been with Bush Heritage for oh, a very long time. I can't remember the exact length of time. And she's our ecologist for the West region. And she's joined by Alex Hams, who's our healthy landscape manager in the West. So let's kick straight off and ask Alex, if I may, to help us understand the southwest of WA. Can you paint a picture for us of um, the types of landscapes and, of course, the bush heritage reserves that are found there? Yeah, I can, Matt. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, well, um, first of all, we we are meeting from um, with you today from from the Manang uh, Noongar people um, from the southwest of WA. Um, this area down here is a is a biodiversity hotspot, um, very important part of the world in terms of um, both the diversity of the vegetation uh, across our our land down this way, um, but also because of the threat um, that are imposed on on the, the, those values, the, the important biodiversity within this area. Um, the, our areas um, that we work in are predominantly in the, the Fitzsterling um, areas, which is between the Stirling Range National Park and the, the Fitzgerald National Park. But we also have a, another reserve up in Cogenup, just a little bit to the northwest of, of that area as well. One of the big threats that we have um, to this land as a part of this landscape is the fragmentation um, as a result of, of clearing for agriculture. Most of that was done a, a long, long time ago, sort of 50 plus years ago. Um, so Bush Heritage um, is trying to do some, some really important work in conserving some of the, the remnant bushland, the, the bush that's um, been left um, remaining as a part, part of this landscape and to try and create a, a connective landscape ac across these areas. Um, we have uh, five different reserves um, across the Southwest, um, covering over five and a half thousand hectares. Um, we have some really great uh, diverse vegetation, over a thousand um, or almost a thousand species of, of plants have been identified on our Fitzsterling reserves. Um, which is quite quite amazing, and and the diversity between the vegetation from one reserve to another is is quite outstanding. Sometimes up to a thirty percent difference between one reserve to another, and they may only be five uh, five or six kilometres away. Um, so it's really important that we we do the work that we do in this area, um, and we also uh, are really conscious to to work with our partners and and um, uh, particularly the, the traditional owners of this area, the Noongar people, 
um, of this land. Um, and we, we make sure that we, we do some um, positive work, both in restoration and, and ecology, but also in conserving uh, a lot of the cultural values that, that are really present um, across this landscape. Um, we are lucky to be working with some really important um, elders um, who, who carry a lot of traditional knowledge of this area um, and uh, managed to speak to um, one of our elders, Uncle Eugene Eads, um, who manages or, or um, caretakes a, a property um, within our Fitzsterling landscape called Now and Up. Um, and I asked him a little bit about uh, what connection to country means for him um, and for his people. And I think we've got a video coming up now. Uh, look, uh, Alex, thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit of that, uh, my connection to country. It's been a journey. I'm a stolen generation background. And um, I've got to learn after coming back to country in 85, Noangra in particular, which was hometown for me, and for most of the Noongar folk, around the area. It was my first step into world leadership amongst my Noongar people once coming back on the country from different areas of my journey. We came to Naunop, Naunop, this, this place here, and uh, I thought it was a wonderful feeling that came over my body. It sort of indicated that I was somewhere near my own, own, own place. I reconnected the country in some way, shape or form, without even knowing it or realising it. And it's, uh, it's been a journey, it's been, been a wonderful journey, even though there's been a little bit of sadness along the way. But the excitement of coming out here and having the freedom and the, and the opportunity to work in partnership in true reconciliation with our colleagues from far and wide, that include Bush Heritage, Shell Australia, Greening Australia, Gondwana Link, Chai councils and neighbouring farmers. All these people that played a big part in this whole journey of healing land and healing people through that process. It's been just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing to happen. It was about us giving back to the Buja and giving back to the emerging leaders coming through and, and, and helping to restore the dignity in the lives of those old people that had it robbed from them. To see this land healed again is, is, is the main thing that I want to see. And I think it's a, it's a precedent that could be a model for lots of other communities to follow with um, in the way that we're working together. And it's about giving back to the land. Land is sitting there with his hands up in the hair. Mama's begging, man. That boy just begging for kneeling. And she wants us to come in as numbers, regardless of the colour of our skin. Come and jump on the bandwagon and heal that land. Well, that was a wonderful, a wonderful invitation, wasn't it, Alex? Yeah. Fantastic. He's, 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 a, he's a great man and he's got a lot of um, wisdom, uh, but he's also got a lot of time to um, put back into that landscape and, and to heal the country. And, and as he talked about, working with um, partners, no matter what their colour of their skin, to, to try and restore the land and the values that that holds, both for his people, but for everyone that, that can enjoy that, that place. Uh, it's really important. And in fact, it's really one of the fundamental tenets of how Bush Heritage works in the landscape, isn't it? Is to invite the traditional owners to share their wisdom and, and wherever possible, when we um, acquire new properties, we always invite the traditional owners to come and help us understand it and interpret it, which is, is wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, Alex. Um, now I've got a question for Angela. Um, the, the thing that inspired me most when I visited Southwest uh, WA many years ago was just that huge, rich array of proteaceous and myrtaceous plant species, big flowers, very flamboyant, very expressive. And once naturally abundant, but I know they face some serious decline since colonisation with land clearing for farming. Um, can you talk to us a bit about what's involved in the revegetation efforts we've been doing, which which of those plants and, and why? And how do you keep track of the plant populations and, and the progress? Because I know we've had some outstanding results, but I think we'd be uh, intrigued to learn how we've how we've that process has evolved. Yeah, okay, um, Matthew, yep, yeah, I can answer that question. Um, 
So I, we've been doing restoration out in that area since 2004. That was the first one we did. And we've, we've progressed a lot since um, that time. We, we used to put in about 40 or 50 species of plants, and that included eucalypts and um, acacias and she-oaks and uh, melaleucas. And since then, we've, um, we've, the technology's improved, and now we can put in up to 150, sometimes 170 species of plant in our restoration. And we do that through direct seeding. So the seeds are collected and they're, they're put in a special mix depending on the soil type. And then they are put in a machine which um, direct seeds them directly into the ground. And then um, what we do is they monitor what comes up afterwards. And most recently, our, our most recent uh, restoration has been Monjubup North, where we've had some excellent success. Um, and we've been incorporating some of the proteaceous species into that restoration, which means things like hakias, banksia, um, grevillea, et cetera. And that has improved um, the way we do our restoration. It's made us think more about how we can use those larger seeded species and put those into the seeding machines. And those that we can't do that with, we actually get grown in nurseries and they're hand planted back into the, into the areas that um, have the soil type that's relevant to those species. So we do, um, we, we're hoping to do a lot more of that sort of work coming up, but Alex will talk to you about that later. And the way we do our monitoring is really to um, set up, we just set up transects or quad and quadrats and we go and measure regularly. So once a year, we go and measure how many plants have germinated um, and the structural layer that they form as time goes on. And it takes about five or six, sometimes longer years to form a, an obvious structure. Because when the plants come up, they're, they're pretty well all the same height. Um, and then eventually the eucalypts will take off and they'll be, be the, the canopy layer. And then we get an understory layer. And the thing we're working on a lot at the moment is the ground layer, because right across the globe, people are finding it difficult to incorporate that ground layer into the restoration. So we have an intern working on that at the moment, and she's having she's interviewing some of the people that have worked in this area. And we had a forum last uh, last week, which is very successful, and um, we're we're now hoping to incorporate some of that. Um, you know, some of the knowledge that we were shared at that forum into our restoration when we next get chance to do some, which will be pretty soon, I hope. Excellent. And we saw some images there, I think, of uh, an interesting looking orange uh, device, which looks like it's part of the uh, direct planting. Is that right? Yeah, and it's called a potty put key. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I, I suspect we might be generating some volunteer interest in using the Potty put key. <laughs> uh, out on reserve. It looks like a fantastic device and a back saver. So, uh, so thanks for that, Ange. There, uh, it there is. we go. Yeah, what a fantastic <laughs> device. Yeah, and I love the color color coded matching there. <laughs> Excellent. Well, the next question I had was um, that revegetation obviously ultimately leads to having habitat for uh, some of the very important. Um, wildlife that is needed um, for those um, those vegetation types and some of the species that benefit from particular pollination service and such like. But before we talk about those, Carnaby's black cockatoo, that's an endangered species, isn't it? And it's one of the animals that I think are benefiting from our work, um, particularly on Monjibuk North. Can you give us a, a bit of a story there? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so the Carnaby's um, black cockatoo unfortunately is declining in, in number. And they, they've had a um, decline of about 50% of their population in the last 45 years. And they're large, um, you know, charismatic birds. And in the past, we used to see flocks of hundreds of them. Um, now we're lucky maybe to see 30 or 40. Occasionally you might get a flock of 100, but it's getting um, more uncommon to see those large flocks. And the reason for that is because of clearing of their both their breeding habitat, which is hollow trees in, in salmon gums um, and wandu, and also their clearing of their feeding habitat, which is totally different, which is in the proteaceous rich um, heaths in the Mallee heaths and the coastal heaths in Southwest WA. 
Um, so that they're, 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 um, in, they're in trouble. So we, we had a donor, um, um, Eva Palmer, who wanted to help the Carnaby's cockatoo and she very generously donated some um, money to us and we were able to enrich some of our plantings on Monjibup North with proteaceous species. So we've, um, we've put in quite a few hectares now that are very rich in proteaceous species and they are now coming to feed in those areas. And it's, it's, um, it's interesting to see that we have a breeding site for Carnaby's cockatoos around um, 12 kilometres away. And we know that there's a, there's a sweet spot around 12 kilometres where their optimum feeding should be from their nesting hollow. If the feeding is any further than that, they get a, a lower um, uh, success rate with their chick, raising their chicks. So we've been really um, happy to provide that habitat for them. And, and you can see on the slides that they're definitely using it and they're feeding in, in there and they, they really in, like the cauliflower hakea. So they've, they've really taken to that. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that we can do for the Carnaby's cockatoo. We've also put up some artificial hollows. Um, they haven't been that successful yet, but we're hopeful that eventually they, they will get used because we have lots of feeding habitat for them now. Yeah. That's fantastic. And I think you've answered one of the questions that's been coming in. Uh, James Ross asks whether they use breeding boxes while you're waiting for the salmon gums to um, return and develop their hollows. But it sounds like um, um, that's what we are doing with these uh, artificial hollows. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. So they're called cockatubes and they're, they're actually tubular. You've got away with words in the West there. Yeah, actually. <laughs> we have, we have. So they, they, and they're using them. So they're, they're successful. They're, they're having successful breeding in these tubes that we hang up in the trees. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's let's um, now talk about, I think, one of everyone's favourite creatures, the honey possum. Um, which is uh, entirely reliant on uh, flowering plants to survive and uh, is a critical part of their life history, isn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about these uh, gorgeous critters? Yes, yeah, they're, they're, I've been so fortunate to see literally um, thousands of them in my career. So they're just wow. amazing little creatures. And they're endemic to the southwest of WA. And in fact, WA, the southwest of WA is the only place they could have evolved on the planet because it's the only place in the world where we have flowering plants um, producing nectar at 12 months of the year. So these little um, creatures, they, they don't have any teeth. They have a very brushy tongue. It's like a paintbrush and they lick out the, the nectar and they also eat the pollen, especially they, they need the pollen when they're breeding. So they need the protein from the pollen to produce young um, and they, that's what they feed on. So obviously we, we had to plan our restoration. So we had something flowering in there every month of the year. So we've, we've done that and we've successfully, that they've moved in from the surrounding native vegetation and they come in fairly quickly. So they, they, they move into the reveg that we do around four, three to four years after it's um, been first sown. So it's fairly quick. They move in and um, we have good populations of honey possums in um, our, re our restora restored areas at the moment. So it's, um, it's working out quite well. And of course, they're not, they're not, a, they're not um, a possum. They're, not, they're only very um, distantly related to possums. So it's a, it's a bit of a strange uh, name for them, really. And they, they eat nectar and pollen. Um, yeah, so it's... Um, it's quite a strange name, but it's just one that's stuck. And I think everyone loves the, the honey possum. What's its Nunga name, Angela? Uh, Nulbinja. Oh, yes. fantastic. Nulbinja. That sounds much more appropriate than honey possum, although honey possum tells you what it does. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wonderful. Wonderful. Um, well, that leads into, you know, the, the challenge of loss of vegetation and food and habitat that affects animals like these uh, carnabies, black cockatoos and the honey possum and threats from um, invasive flora and fauna and the challenges of um, uh, unnatural fire patterns, which um, I would imagine take a, a heavy toll from time to time. Um, Alex, can you tell us what, what actions we do to address these pressures? Yeah, sure, Matt. So um, 
obviously the threat from feral predators, particularly cats and foxes, um, is is a major major issue um, across across our country, across the world, in fact. Um, but particularly in our area, where we have you know the norbanger um, and a, a bunch of other small little marsupials that are, are critical weight. Um, so that sort of weight range between sort of 35 to, to 350 to 500 grams um, that are really under threat um, from predation from, from cats and foxes. Um, with the support of uh, some funding through Lotteries West um, over here, we've uh, just initiated um, a, a program, um, a fauna recovery program, um, partly controlling some of the foxes and the cats across the landscape, but also addressing the issues related to um, uh, rabbits. All three of those um, invasive species are, are very highly um, linked and related, um, and we need to make sure that we control all of them at, at once to make sure that we, we don't have a, an explosion in numbers of, of one or the other um, to try and protect our native, our native fauna. Um, we have, uh, we have a lot of monitoring um, around that, so we can demonstrate how well we've been able to um, deliver um, on, on that control um, and how, how much benefit that that's providing to our native fauna. So we're doing this over a long period of time. And in fact, we actually, we launched this project uh, one year ago today um, uh, out at one of our field station out, out at Redmore Reserve. Um, which is pretty exciting. Um, we've had some really great response in terms of um, working with our partners, in um, particular uh, the, Bio the Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attraction, who manages two significant um, nature reserves in, in our, across our landscape. Um, and we're also working with um, traditional owners uh, in the area, including Uncle Eugene Eads and, and some of the rangers that are, that are working on the Now and Up property. Um, but also working with private landholders. And, and that's really where we're trying to focus on creating a, a nice buffer around some of our reserves and some of the nature reserves that are existing uh, across that area. Um, we, we know that we need to do this over a large area. We know that we need to do it over a long period of time. So we're doing this project is a five year project and we will continue to do that for, for a number of more years to, to come in terms of controls. And, and utilise different methods of control to be able to, to um, make sure that we do have a, a, an ongoing impact and a, and a lasting legacy for, for a lot of our native species to, to return to their, you know, as close to, to um, you know, um, the numbers that they were before uh, a lot of these predators came across in, and into our landscape. That's fantastic, Alex. Um, now, um, we mentioned that uh, uh, there's a lot of optimism in the air and uh, we have some very exciting news that uh, this is the first opportunity to share. I didn't mention anything about the, the fire risks um, and, no. and that's, that's an important thing to, to remember um, in terms of the threat to, to our landscape. We've, we've just recently had a, a number of... Um, devastating bushfires across the southwest of WA. In fact, just on, on the weekend just passed, and it's a, it's a timely reminder for us all that the threat that that, that has on not only our, our lives and our and our homes, but also to the um, to the ecology and, and and the native wildlife that that live um, within the bushland. Um, Bush Heritage does a lot of work. Um, to try and mitigate some of those risks and we get some some great support from some of our partners and, and sponsors and donors um, to help us achieve those those outcomes. Um, down here in the southwest we really work really closely with um, Noongar Rangers to, to provide training to, to help them um, to be able to, to get out and, and do bushfire management. Um, we do a lot of um, bushfire um, mitigation efforts in terms of track maintenance and fire break maintenance uh, and we work as well with the local fire, bushfire brigades um, to help look at um, how we can try and uh, implement good strategies to, to reduce those wildfires. Um, and we're hoping to be able to encourage 
um, and work with our traditional owners in this area and the Noongar people of, of Southwest WA to do some cultural burning uh, across some of our reserves, um, providing some some um, barriers between um, or some some safe areas, I guess, some some little breaks. Uh, within the vegetation where some of those wildfires may be held up or at least be able to be controlled and, and mitigated. So really important work that we're doing. And, and I know that um, those folks over in the East Coast that, that might be tuning in have had some, some devastating uh, impacts over the last couple of years. And, um, you know, we really need to work hard on, on managing that, particularly in the face of climate change and, and the emergence of, of higher temperatures you know, lower rainfall at certain times of the year and um, the impacts that, that that'll bring to our, uh, to our landscape. Yeah, fantastic. And um, that's that uh, partly answers a question we had from Kevin, which was about, did the, have the big fires affected any of the reserves in your part of the world? Or have you been, I think you've been the lucky ones, haven't you, in, in not we, being affected? Yeah, yeah, we have, Matt. So um, we're, we're extremely grateful that we didn't have any of the impacts of the fires that that we've experienced across the southwest. Um, th there are some um, devastating fires that have, have occurred in Denmark and um, Bridgetown, um, but also now in, in Corridge and in the Wheatbelt. Um, some really um, sort of devastating scenes when you see the, the, the walls of flames that are, are, are tearing across mm. the landscape and not only taking out homes and, and sheds and, and assets, but also um, you know, impacting on on the, the lives of some of the, our native um, fauna that that exist in in those areas. You know, we do know that our our bushland can come back from from some of these fires, and um, you know, where they're intact and and they're resilient, um, and you have good native vegetation, then then we know that they will restore. Um, but it, it takes some time for the for the fauna to to. Um, I guess re-engage with with those areas, um, and as I said before, the, the the cats and the foxes take advantage of those sort of cleared um, uh, areas after after fire comes through, and and we know that they can have a, a devastating impact on on returning uh, native fauna and, um, post fire. Indeed. Well, I think um, I jumped the gun a bit, but I've just been so excited about it, and this is partly uh, an answer to a question from Marianne who's asked, how do we re-establish connectivity? And we've already talked about, obviously, the revegetation that we're doing on reserves. But one of the other ways is that we are always looking to acquire properties that have some native remnant veg and um, continue the process of connecting up the landscape, don't we? So the exciting news, and as I was indicating, this is probably the first opportunity we've had to share it, is that um, we're looking to acquire a new property in the region that's going to give us some really good reconnection and resilience in that Fitzsterling landscape. So tell us all about it, Alex, because it's one of the things that I think has got everybody uh, very excited. Yeah. So one of the one of the important things that we're doing in the Fitzsterling landscape is, is all about reconnect, reconnection and connectivity to create a resilient landscape. Um, part of that is to try and join up uh, large remnant bushland areas to other existing large remnant bushland areas, um, and we have a, a chance to do that with the with the acquisition of our um, of the Eddie Garrett property, uh, just over a thousand hectares um, in size. Um, but this property is really important in its location because it will connect our Redmore Reserve across to the Crackerup Creek. Um, uh, unallocated Crown Land Reserve and then further across to uh, Chingarup Sanctuary, which is an important um, private um, conservation property um, run through uh, Eddie and Donna Wayon to, um, to staunch environmental supporters and, and um, uh, private landholders that, that have gone in and, and invested in um, bushland property. Um, so it'd be great to see the acquisition of this property uh, and the restoration um, and putting back of, of some of our native um, flora to be able to create that connectivity uh, across that, that landscape. And I think everyone can see on the, on the screen here um, uh, an image of uh, an aerial photo across our landscape with our Redmore Reserve, large remnant bushland in, in, in the middle of the, uh, of the picture. Uh, the Stirling Range National Park in, in um, 
in the background. Um, but in the foreground there, you can see some little strips of, of vegetation. And that's actually the, um, the, the bottom corner of, of the Chingarup, uh, sorry, the uh, Eddie Garup property that we're looking to acquire, um, which creates a, a nice little connection between, between our reserve and, and again, that some of that large remnant bushland. And it's really exciting for us as a, um, both an organisation um, and helping to address um, our goal of, of doubling and deepening our impact uh, as a part of our 2030 strategy, but also um, within our region, our area, uh, it's really important that we continue to progress that um, con connective nature of, of our, um, our landscape. And this offers a, a great opportunity to do some really great um, biodiverse reveg uh, on, on our uh, property and, and to incorporate some of the learnings and the knowledge that we've gained, um, as Angela was talking about, through uh, improving the way that we do our, our ground layer revegetation, uh, increase the diversity um, of our ve uh, revegetation and um, be able to provide some of that critical habitat for, for our native wildlife uh, in the area. At the moment, it, 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 uh, there's 600 hectares of, of cleared land uh, on there, which has been run as a, a sheep farming and, and cropping operation. Uh, and we'll be looking to steadily progressively um, uh, remove the, the farming operation off there uh, as we do our revegetation. Um, there's over 300 hectares of remnant, good remnant bushland on, on the property, um, which is at, uh, you know, pretty impressive for, for the area that we're, we're working in in that fragmenta, fragmented landscape. Um, but we're looking to try and connect up all those little dots and, and make sure that the wildlife have a, a nice corridor to, to provide that habitat and to create that connectivity um, and resilience across, the, across our properties. Excellent. Well, thanks, Alex, for, for telling us why that's such an amazing property. And um, I just want to uh, endorse that uh, as an organisation, we really, really want to acquire this property. So if any of you listening today have been inspired by Alex and Angela talking about the Southwest and what a difference that landscape is and makes, then uh, one of my colleagues in the West, Jackie Smith, whose details will be put in the chat, would love to hear from you. Um, because we're in the process of uh, negotiating uh, and finalising that. And so any support you have would be wonderful. End of plug. So to finish up with, we're going to go to some questions. We've had a fantastic lot of questions coming through. We'll do our best to answer them in the time available. Um, uh, so um, we'll cover the ones that I think are most relevant to the conversation. There have been a few questions come through that have been very specific to other landscapes that we might not be able to respond to in the webinar, but we will follow up with those people afterwards. So the first question that was sent in just before the webinar was, um, what are the processes, uh, this is from Zoe Inman, what are the processes that were used for planting the seeds and plants? We've talked about direct seeding being the main form, but I think Zoe's keen to understand if we tried ground ripping and weed control methods and whether there's any relative success or failures in the different approaches. Is that one for you, Alex, or is that a better one for Ange? Yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer that. So uh, as Angela mentioned um, uh, earlier, we predominantly use direct seeding as our approach to, to do revegetation. Um, we have some really great success in using direct seeding. Um, there are some species that we can't um, put through the, the machine that just the size of the seed uh, is not is not suitable for, for that sort of um, delivery. Um, and that's where we, we would definitely go back into putting your seedlings in um, specifically. But um, as a part of that direct seeding um, approach, a lot of the new a lot of the new direct seeding machines have uh, ripping tines on them, so that we do um, sort of create um, a nice channel of um, disturbed soil where the the roots can um, uh, get down and and we can retain some of that moisture. We also, generally speaking, uh, because we're in a relatively low rainfall area, uh, we do some scalping uh, along those rip lines just to make sure that. Well, one, the weed burden is, is reduced, but two, 
um, any moisture that does fall on that on that area um, goes down towards the, the seedling uh, and, and provides them the best opportunity for survival. Um, that's probably a, a, a reasonable response to that question, I think, Matt. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, and there's a question which I think is on many people's minds all the time, um, which is, and I guess, and you can probably help us with this one. Are we considering reintroducing any of the regionally extinct species to, to the region, to Mondrabup or Red Mort, you know, those that have got really good vegetation? And uh, she, um, this is some Kari Garno, I think that's the right pronunciation, Kari, who's a biodiversity project officer with the Northern Agricultural Catchment Council. And she's mentioned numbats, which might be a personal favourite. They certainly are of mine. <laughs> yeah, everyone loves numbats. Um, oh, I would love to get numbats out in back in that country. Um, it's it's not it's not a reality at the moment for, for numbats, but we we have reintroduced red-tailed fascigales back into our cogenut property that became locally extinct. So we did that um, in 2010 and 2011. And we have a very healthy, um, thriving population of red-tailed fascigales now at Cogenup and beyond. They have spread into the to the remnant vegetation um, uh, that's adjacent to Cogenup. But for the Fitz Sterling, we we are at actually just putting up nest boxes for red-tailed fascigales now on our Cheraninup property. We want to know if they're already there, and if they're not, they'll be one of the first species we look at reintroducing once we've, um, we're, we're convinced that the fox and cat numbers are more under control and we can actually keep them fa at fairly low population. We'll never get rid of them at the moment through that area, but we're just wanting to um, decrease the populations of the introduced predators. And then we will reintroduce red-tailed fascigales to uh, Cheranin up. If they're already there, of course, we don't need to do that, but we will be able to, they'll be able to increase their population once we start getting the cats and foxes um, numbers down. The other thing that we really, is our long-term plan is to reintroduce woilies to the Fitzsterling mm -hmm. area. So we're talking with the Department of um, Conservation and Attractions at the moment, and uh, that's, that's certainly on our radar for the next 10 years. Um, numbats, maybe later. Um, but um, certainly woilies are on our radar, which is, um, it, which is really encouraging, yeah. That's fantastic. Okay, well, I'm going to move to some of the other questions we've got, and uh, I might group some of these if to, for the benefit of um, uh, speed. Um, a couple of questions on climate change, I'm just checking my notes here, and whether that's likely to affect the species that we're planting. Um, and that's probably um, because in recognition of the fact that Bush Heritage is doing some work in the east on getting climate ready reveg and different provenancing. So if there's a short answer to that, Ange, that um, yep, could yep. give us a sense of whether the species are changing and whether we're adapting and changing in our thinking. OK, we've given this a lot of thought and we've we've um, consulted some of the best experts in this area and their best advice at the moment is is to still keep using very, very local provenance seed, which means that we collect seed from as close as possible to the area that we were vegetating. And we're pretty fortunate in the Fitzsterling that we've got quite a lot of remnant vegetation left. And it's, it's, it's pretty healthy remnant vegetation. It hasn't been disturbed. There are no weeds in there. So we, get, we, get, we can get our seeds from there. Um, this landscape is ancient and it's been undisturbed for millions and millions of years and the plants have evolved over you know, 40 or million years or so. And they're, it, genetically, they're very resilient to climate change. I know that it's happening a lot faster than it has in the past, um, but at this, and at this stage, we're getting advice that's saying, don't mess with it. At, you know, mm. just, just use local provenance seed, basically. Because if we bring seed from further afield, even in, from a drier area, it probably won't survive. So we're, we're playing, um, you know, we're playing it safe and we're taking that advice. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and I think a linked question to that was um, sort of the monitoring of different species as they grow and the time frames before you get a decent structure in the habitat and you're getting ecological benefit. I know that's a, probably a very... A uh, long piece of string to to measure when you get benefit, which you know starts almost yeah. immediately. But any sense of how you know? I know honey possums came surprised us by coming back quickly, didn't they? 
more they quickly did. than we thought. Yeah, yeah. and and pygmy possums and um, the bird the birds came back fairly very quickly um, because they mm. they keep more into structure than the floristics of the region. Um, we we try and uh, get all the structures represented, and then we get most of the birds back very very quickly. Um, and some birds disappeared, so things like. Richard's pipit that like open areas, they've gone yes. from our reveg, and that's mm. that's just the way it is. Um, because now we're providing habitat for up to 30 species of honey eater and lots of the ground insectivores and all that sort of um, different suites of birds. So we it, it's working quite well. And and as I said, I think I said before, it takes four or five years for us to start seeing that structure develop. And then as time goes on, some of the restoration now is 20 years old. We, mm. We've got a very good, um, you know, we've got a couple of structural layers. It's not perfect, but we're, we're improving that the way, uh, every time we do our restoration. Fantastic. And um, I guess another link question is, because um, it's a very popular concept, is drone seeding. Have we done any, um, you know, uh, investigation of the possibility of doing seeding by, with the use of drones. I know it is being used somewhere in the world. Alex? <laughs> yeah, I, so we, we, we've looked into it um, and definitely that's a, it's an option that we'll continue to explore. We, we're going to continue to explore any, any new technology that can help us to achieve our outcomes, particularly in restoration and revegetation. Um, at the moment, we probably see the traditional direct seeding approach uh, as, as the preferred option. Um, a lot of the area that we're trying to restore um, is open farmland, so it's very accessible for large large scale machinery and it's probably a little bit more efficient and effective for us to do it in that way. Um, I certainly see drone uh, drone seeding as a, as a really viable option in um, largely inaccessible uh, locations. Um, and, and I'm really, I'm really interested to see um, some of the examples of, of that being done in other places and seeing where, where that might be applicable across our landscape or, or across other bush heritage landscapes uh, around Australia. Yes, fantastic. We've had a couple of questions in around uh, weeds. Um, I suspect a number of our supporters and uh, listeners today are, uh, are fighting weeds in their chosen patches. So what's what's our particular struggle, struggles? And uh, I noticed there was a bit of chat in the chat about who had the worst gr invasive grass species in their region. So what's what are you tackling down there? Uh, uh, look, a lot, of, a lot of the worst weeds that we have in, in our space are um, uh, come over from, from South Africa. So the velvet grass and the love grass are, are two of the, the worst species in terms of invasiveness across, across our landscape. Um, on our reserves um, specifically, we have very little weed burden. We're, we're quite lucky. Um, the few patches that we did have um, uh, once we acquired those reserves had, had been uh, controlled fairly quickly and, and over a um, reasonably long period of time. We're pretty persistent with it, um, but we do see those um, weeds emerging on some of our, um, you know, disturbed road reserves, for instance, and, and on the edges of some of the paddocks. Um, we do, when we, when we see some of these weeds, we do control them. Um, one of the most effective ways to control some of those weeds uh, is through the use of, of chemicals and um, glyphosate and other chemicals are, are, are generally used um, by us. We we occasionally use a, um, uh, um, some chemicals that are, are more, um, uh, I guess, um, retentive in, in the soil um, so that they, they have a longer lasting impact in terms of pre-emergence of, of new seed um, seed banks. But um, generally, that's that's on our on our um, fire breaks and, and things like that, where we we actually don't actively want to to have any any vegetation at all, um, and and that's a, a priority for us. Um, but we're quite lucky in in most of our reserve areas that they're either you know remnant bushland with very little weed burden, or or um, on our revegetation, um, we generally do um, one or two passes of of weed control and um, allow the the canopy of that vegetation to actually shade out and prevent a lot of weeds emerging uh, in that area. We also 
we've had a really good year this year over the last 12 months in terms of rainfall in our, our part of the landscape. And um, we've had a, a, a massive bloom of, of a lot of the, the native wallaby grass um, down our way. And so we've actually got this um, big carpet of uh, Danthonia uh, emerging a, across any of the, the areas that are still open. Uh, and it's actually out competing a lot of the um, weed species that we've seen in, in the area. Um, which is a, a fantastic outcome and hopefully the seed from that will, will continue to, to develop a, um, a, a nice seed bank for, for future emergence in years coming. Fantastic. Um, well, I think uh, we're running out of time. Um, we had a question from James Mum who asked um, how much we need to buy Eddie Garrett, which I thought was an excellent question. So the purchase price for that property is 2.7 mil, I think, isn't it? Yeah, that's uh, right, Alex. And we're yep. on the way to raising that, but we still got a long way to go. So um, that uh, hopefully we can secure that funding, and then um, Alex will have, uh, well, both Alex and Ange will have a bigger job to do uh, in managing that property as well. So um, for those other questions, and James, I know you asked some very specific questions about uh, your area of uh, restoration work up at Cape Perrin. Um, we will have to get back to you after this webinar because we've run out of time and I think your questions were very specific and we're not sure we can answer them from our direct experience um, further east. But anybody else who had a question that we didn't manage to get to, um, we'll shoot those through to Alex and Andrew and they will do their very best to uh, provide an answer. Um, and thanks um, everybody who's been on the webinar for answering some of the questions as we went along. We've had some questions about what a boil is and uh, what that lovely bird behind you is, Alex, which have been answered in the chat. So thank you everybody for contributing to the, to the Q and A. Um, so um, just to wrap up, um, thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Alex and Angela. Uh, it's been magnificent hearing about your work. And as soon as your beloved uh, premier lets us all back, I think there'll be a few people um, ripping over to uh, WA to come and have a look. Uh, and thanks to all our supporters and those of you who are listening and thinking about it today. Um, your support for our work is absolutely vital and we can only do it with you. Um, we've got another webinar coming up, thank you, um, in March on the 23rd. That'll be all about protecting the night parrot and um, other precious species that we have out on our Pullen Pullen Reserve in the, re in the Diamantina region of Southwest Queensland. And that'll be Nick Leserberg, who's one of the people, very few people in the world who's handled the night parrot. He's been studying it as part of his PhD and our reserve manager, Rowan Hinchley. So uh, that'll be up on our website soon. Also a quick plug, um, Bush Heritage has just recently started off its first foray into the podcast world. And it's a podcast series called Big Sky Country. Um, it's really beautiful. It, trans it transports you away um, in, uh, because of listening to the landscape. And the next one, which is the only just come out this week, is all about the secret life of Fasca Gales. So we've been talking today about the Fasca Gales. Uh, and this podcast, you can get the link on the web and we'll put it in the chat. It's really worth listening to. You'll get the experience of climbing a tree, opening an Xbox, an S box, and finding these wonderful little critters. And also hearing about the translocation project to Kojinup that we've mentioned. So that's a quick last plug. And just to finish off with, we've got some wonderful slides um, that our producer, Megan, shout out to Megan for producing this today. Um, she's put together a wonderful series of slides um, that will entertain you um, in the next sort of four minutes or so, if you'd like to stick around and just tempt yourself for that next visit. So thanks, Angela. Thanks, Alex. Really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to updating everybody about the outcome of our Eddie Garrop acquisition very shortly. Thank you. Cheers for now.
Thank you.